Welcome to the Daily Dispatch. Today we'll tell you about Pakistan government preparing itself to meet all the conditions set by the IMF. Next on the Dispatch, we'll give you an update on the Russia-Ukraine war and the tensions mounting between the NATO allies. And lastly, we'll discuss if Israel and Saudi Arabia will really initiate their diplomatic relations or not. We're here to give you the news and to help you infer the world around you. I'm Tayyab Anasar Khan, and here is your Daily Dispatch. In a bid to revive the International Monetary Fund's loan program, the Pakistani government has reportedly agreed to meet all the conditions set by the International Financial Institution. This decision comes weeks after the Pakistani Prime Minister met with the IMF chief in Geneva on the sidelines of the United Nations Conference on Climate Resilience and extensive virtual discussions between the two parties. Now, the IMF's conditions relate to increasing the revenue collection, allowing the market to determine the value of Pakistani currency, imposing more taxes, and doing away with the subsidies. The IMF's loan facilities to the economies in trouble always comes with stringent conditions for the fiscal reforms, the revenue collection, exchange rate, and social policy, among the others. Although the aim is to help the countries overcome the balance of payment crisis, the gap between the revenue and the spending, that is, its conditions also contribute to more inflation and rise in commodity prices, which affects the most vulnerable segments of the population the hardest. It is predicted that Pakistani government will increase the rates of gas and electricity prices and roll out a new set of taxes to meet the revenue gap, along with allowing a market-based exchange rate. Now, Pakistan finds itself in an economically difficult situation. The IMF's loan will not only help Pakistan overcome its balance of payment crisis, but will pave the way for more external loans. However, taxes and increase in the prices will increase the burden on the common people, who are already reeling under rising inflation, a weak post-flood economic recovery, the fears of growing unemployment due to dwindling manufacturing productivity, and high commodity prices as a result of disruptions in the supply chains. Although Pakistan's lack of structural reforms, competitive export base, robust revenue base, increased tax to GDP and modernization of agriculture, it all has been blamed for the recurrence of IMF's loan programs. The tough negotiations and delay in IMF's current loan program is also being attributed to Islamabad's reduced political leverage vis-a-vis -vis the US, the largest financial contributor, after the end of the Afghanistan war. Next, we'll give you an update on the Russia-Ukraine war. Now, tensions are mounting among the NATO allies as the UK, Poland, Finland, and the Baltic states demand that NATO members send heavier military equipment to Ukraine. Tensions especially seem to be high between Germany and the US, or the US's insistence that Germany supplies its Leopard tanks to Ukraine. Now, German leadership, however, remains reluctant to any unilateral action on this front. And the Vice Chancellor has stated that if the US were to send its own Abram tanks to Ukraine, it would be easier for Germany to follow suit. The Polish Prime Minister, Matthias Morawiecki, has also expressed an inclination to supply German tanks in its possession without the consent of German allies, if Germany fails to provide them directly. He also criticized the German leadership for being the least proactive in support of Ukraine. While the US has supplied the Soviet-era tanks to Ukraine, the provision of the Abram tanks seemed to be a matter of contention within the Pentagon and the defense community in Washington. While some leaders, including Sabrina Singh, have said that the Abram tanks would be a tactical liability on the battlefield due to their high maintenance cost. Other officials have gone to invoke Germany's losses against the former Soviet Union as the reason for German reluctance. While NATO members continue to negotiate the issue of who should supply the tanks to Ukraine first, the former Russian Prime Minister, Dmitry Medvedev, has come out with a stark warning that Russia's loss in Ukraine could mean a nuclear war. The Kremlin soon issued a statement supporting Medvedev's claim, which is in line with the Russian nuclear doctrine. However, the Kremlin spokesperson dismissed the claim that Russia is escalating the conflict to a higher level. Russia holds the largest nuclear weapons stockpile in the world at present, with the US coming in at second place, making the currently unfolding situation a matter of great concern. On the other hand, the cooperation and consensus within the NATO are also facing problems. Experts have opined that the deteriorating situation could put the world on a fast track for the spillover of the conflict outside of Ukraine, 
if NATO continues to ignore the concerns and discord within the collective. Whether NATO's rule will remain within the ambit of indirect support to Ukraine, or whether it will graduate to direct participation in hostilities still remains to be seen. Let's now talk about the possibility of Saudi-Israel diplomatic relations. In its first visit, after coming into power of the far-right Israeli government of Benjamin Netanyahu, the National Security Advisor of the United States, Jake Sullivan, discussed some significant issues including the possibility of establishing diplomatic relations between Israel and Saudi Arabia. Israeli Prime Minister has been actively working towards normalization of relations between Israel and Saudi Arabia, which has only remained on the top of the foreign policy agendas of Premier Netanyahu's government believing that it will drive peace in the region by bringing an end to the Arab-Israeli conflict. Israel is hoping Washington will facilitate and expedite this process. However, the recent tense relations between Washington and Riyadh, following the OPEC Plus decision to not increase the oil production in the backdrop of energy crisis, which were triggered by the Russia-Ukraine war, might not yield the desired outcome. Now, Israel has been putting in the effort to normalize relations with the Arab and Gulf states. On September 15, 2020, the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain signed the Abraham Accords brokered by the former president, Donald Trump, normalizing ties with Israel. Now, Morocco established ties in a separate deal brokered by Trump administration of the United States and has currently decided to expand their defense cooperation into intelligence, air defense, and electronic warfare. Saudi Arabia has stated that public recognition of Israel would depend on the resolution of the Palestinian conflict and the implementation of the two-state solution. However, many analysts believe that the UAE, and especially Bahrain, could not have embarked on this path without some support from Riyadh. Saudi Arabia has allowed direct flights to Manama in Bahrain, and Abu Dhabi and Dubai in the UAE, via its airspace. Moreover, the kingdoms of Bahrain and Saudi Arabia share strong ties, with Bahrain frequently requesting support from the KSA to quell the Shia protests in the country. Most believe that Bahrain only established ties with Israel after receiving support from Saudi Arabia, without which they say it wouldn't have been possible. However, despite the growing speculations of Israel and Saudi Arabia coming close to establishing diplomatic relations, there are still some constraints. Saudi Arabia houses the two holiest cities in the Muslim world, Mecca and Medina, and are looked up to by many Muslim countries. It also provides vocal support to the Palestinians and is a strong proponent of the Palestinian capital to be in the East Jerusalem. All of these issues restrict Saudi Arabia from openly announcing the recognition of Israel. And Washington understands this constraint as well. Next on the dispatch, India's Ministry of Electronics and IT has proposed amendments to the Information Technology Rules 2021, whereby any information that is identified as fake or false by the Press Information Bureau or any other body authorized by the government for fact-checking will be prohibited on social media platforms. Any such information should be removed by the social media platforms and they should ensure that the users don't interact with that information. The Editors Guild in India, the top editor's body, slammed the new fake news amendment and urged the government to rethink the laws because the determination of fake news solely by the government will result in censorship of the press. Over the years, India, which calls itself the largest democracy in the world, has experienced censorship and a crackdown on the journalists. India ranks 150th among the 180 countries in the annual World Press Freedom Index 2022 of the Reporters Without Borders. Incidents such as the social media harassment of and stopping the Indian female journalist Rana Ayub at the airport over alleged money laundering arresting Fahad Shah from Indian-occupied Kashmir over the charges of spreading fake news and glorifying terrorism, and a statement by WhatsApp confirming that Indian journalists and human rights activists were among 1,400 whose phones were hacked by the Israeli software Pegasus, are all examples of censorship in India. In the backdrop of these and more cases of censorship, the Editors Guild and many others are questioning if these amendments are really targeting misinformation or if it aims to quell the voice of journalists and activists, which goes against the basic principles of democracy. We'll now give you a humanitarian update. The German parliament officially recognized the massacre of 1,200 Yazidis by the Islamic State in the Mount Sanjid area of Iraq in 2014. In the same string of events, around 500,000 Yazidi individuals were displaced, and 5,000 women and children were taken into slavery. 
The move has come in recognition and support of the Yazidi community housed in Germany, the largest Yazidi diaspora in the world. The 2014 massacre also led to a high number of Yazidi women taking up arms against the Islamic State, a detrimental challenge to the ideology of the Islamic State, which believes that a fighter's death at the hands of women bars their entry into heaven as a martyr. This development caused a significant dip in the IS morale, while empowering the women to defend themselves against the capture and subsequent sex slavery that they were subjected to at the hands of their captors. Now, Germany has also carried out two convictions for abetting genocidal acts against the Yazidis. The first being an Iraqi who was put on trial in Frankfurt in 2020 and convicted in 2021. The second conviction was awarded to a German citizen in 2022 for abetting genocide and slavery. These are the only two known convictions for the 2014 genocide, not only in Germany, but the world entirely. And lastly, the US government has reached its debt ceiling, creating fears of default with far-reaching economic consequences for the US and global economies. So what is the debt ceiling? Debt ceiling is the legal limit on how much a government can borrow. It currently stands at around 32 trillion USD in the United States, more than 100% of its GDP. As the US economy has grown over the years, so has its debt ceiling, increasing more dramatically in the last 10 years, rising to over 30 trillion USD in 2020 from just over 10 trillion USD in 2010. A traditional way of averting a default has been either to suspend the ceiling or revise it. The US has done it more than 70 times in its history, including three times in the last six months. However, with the Republican Party enjoying a majority in the US Congress, which has the power to suspend or revise the debt ceiling, the prospect of not reaching an agreement has raised fears of a default. Many countries in the past either defaulted or were on the brink of it. Iceland defaulted on its loans in 2008. Sri Lanka recently defaulted on its external loans. Greece was saved from a near default situation by the EU economic bailout package. But given the size of the US economy and the dominance of the dollar as a reserve currency, the repercussions of an economic default would be catastrophic for both the US and the world. So what will be the economic repercussions of the US economic default? According to Third Way, a research think tank, in case of a default, the US would lose 3 million jobs and its debts would further increase. Moreover, it would drive the US businesses and consumers to reduce purchases and imports from the outside, hitting the developing states the hardest, which rely on the huge US market for exports. It also includes Pakistan whose biggest export market is the United States. In addition, a prolonged recession as a result of default will amplify the voices from developed economies like China and EU to question the dominance of US dollar as global currency. These ominous predictions will be averted if the Democrats and Republicans are able to come to an agreement to revise the debt ceiling. That's all, folks. We'd be happy to receive your feedback and suggestions. We'll be back tomorrow with more bite-sized news that keeps you up to date with what's going on in the country, the region, and the globe. I'm Tayyab Khan, and this was your Daily Dispatch.